Okay, looks like we're sorted into our rooms and we can begin. So we'll start with some introductions. Um, I'm Ben Cates, I'm the principal at Ogden Middle School. Good evening, I'm Michael Sweden, I'm the principal at Gardner Middle School. Hi, I'm Rachel Lingstrom. I'm the vice principal at Gardner Middle School. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Craig. I'm the vice principal at Ogden Middle School. Hi there, I'm Ingrid. I'm Kiri Martin. Entrenadora para ellos. Cristina Magaña. In the Escuela Media, también soy instructor. Good evening, everybody. I am Sarah Dubois. I'm the director of teaching and learning for Oregon City School District. Hi, I'm Jennifer Bell, Associate Director of Teaching and Learning for the Oregon City School District. And we'll turn it back to Ben for some introductions. Okay, thanks everybody. Yeah, we're really here to talk about instructional changes for next year. Um, we're planning on doing more than one of these forums. Um, future ones will focus on a new schedule um, and as well as the construction. But we really thought what we wanted to start with was instruction because that's really what's going to change and we'll talk about how the building and our instructional model work together. Tonight we'll be talking a bit about vision and mindset, the vision for instruction, the vision for middle schools, and the mindset we're trying to develop in our learning communities. We'll be talking about instructional practices, we'll be talking about our reporting practices, and then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Um, we're also recording this, so if anybody you know wanted to be here but couldn't, um, this recording will be available on the district and school websites um, so people can see it, especially as we get closer to next year and you might be thinking, what did they say about some of those changes now that it's really coming at us? You can go and uh, re-listen to this or re-watch it. We're going to start um, with a video that was put together by our district communications team. Um, that's really emceed here by um, our assistant superintendent, Kyle Lair, talking about the vision for middle schools in Oregon City. Hi, I'm Kyle Lair, assistant superintendent for the Oregon City School District. And I'm excited to share with you how our community came together to design and build some extremely unique and innovative learning environments for our middle school students. This happened through really two different efforts that were going on at the same time after the gracious passing of the 2018 bond by the Oregon City community. Portrait of a graduate. This is an effort that's being done by school districts throughout the country that really focuses in on aspirationally, what do we want to see for all of our graduates? Every student that comes through our system, what are those 21st century skills that we want to see all of them leaving with so that they can be successful in their future? We were able to develop a vision for where it was that we wanted our students to go and the skills that we wanted them to develop as they followed through our community from kindergarten through 12th grade. That began to give us a vision of what we wanted education to look like. Our middle school design team came together and much like the portrait of the graduate, brought together industry people, people from the community college, board members, students who played a huge, huge role in this, educators and parents to design our buildings. And we quickly decided that we were not just going to create a new building that looked like the buildings we've had from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Instead, we decided to design a building that was designed around the type of education we wanted to see our kids experience here. And so as you listen on throughout the evening, you're going to hear from a lot of our staff about where we're going educationally, what that's going to look like for our students, and what these amazing environments are going to do to support that. We want our students to come to a school where they can courageously become whoever they're going to be while still feeling a deep sense of belonging. We want our students to be able to collaborate, think critically, and work on authentic projects that have meaning beyond the walls of the school. We want our students to be reflective so that when they make mistakes, and everyone makes mistakes, that they learn from them and their product gets even better. We want our students to care for themselves, for each other, and for this place, as well as the world around them. Collaborative, authentic learning communities that work together on real life projects. UDL, or Universal Design Learning, is a framework that is inclusive 
and effective for all learners. It reduces barriers and provides students choice in their learning. And I'm excited as an educator that we are implementing UDL in our middle schools. Grounded in research, culturally relevant practices form connections between what students are learning in school and to their background knowledge, life experiences, and culture. And what this means at our new middle schools is that students will be working with content that is relevant, that requires critical thinking, and it will honor the wealth of knowledge that they come with. So design thinking is really great because it allows students to solve real problems using a process that engages them in the community around them and thinking about real life issues and allowing them to use the tools that they have. It really lets the students kind of explore from where they're at and is much more equitable than giving them all the same kind of thing to work on. We're going to be doing a lot of uh, problem-based learning and problem-based learning is when kids can uh, use empathy interviews to come up with uh, solutions to some kind of worldwide problem that we need them uh, to solve and that they are excited to solve. And we go through a whole process. Uh, and they will be interviewing uh, each other. They'll be interviewing other people outside of our school community. They'll also be coming up with different uh, solutions to problems that uh, we have throughout either our school or kind of our community here. We want our students to be future ready much more than we want them to be test ready. Now that we're transitioning to a new way of learning, we're going to focus on student learning and proficiency grading. So proficiency grading gives a score from one through four, one being the basic and four being above mastery we will be using dynamic standard-based report cards to give parents and students more information about their learning towards the standards. I want to thank everyone in our community for passing the 2018 bond. Middle school and early adolescence is an extremely important time in the development of a child. I truly believe that the physical changes we've made to the buildings, the mindsets that we're bringing into our school culture, the instructional practices that our teachers have been working so hard on improving and innovating, and the proficiency-based grading will put a focus on the individual student in a way that inspires them and helps them fully develop into their potential as they move towards adulthood. So thank you once again for your support and look forward to seeing our community and our buildings, seeing the amazing things that our kids are going to be doing for years to come. We're so glad you could join us today for the Ogden Middle School groundbreaking ceremony. It's an exciting day for Oregon City School District. This has been in planning for many years. It goes back three or four years ago and actually started in 2000 when the community approved a bond to transform. Thank you to our communications department who did a really wonderful job. Putting Hi, the I'm Kyle Lair, Assistant way. Superintendent for the Oregon City School. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about mindset. What you have in front of you right now is the portrait of a graduate, which um, Mr. Lair mentioned as really our North Star, what we're aiming at to develop K-12 in our schools, who we're hoping our students become um, when they're done uh, with their public education in Oregon City. The mindset that we're aiming for is, is different from the one I think that we've been un unintentionally building. The one that we've been sort of unintentionally building, one in which we're really rewarding work completion. And you know, work completion is important. We all have to finish what we start. Um, the problem really is that that's been the primary way that we've been rewarding students or describing their learning is through how much work they finished. Instead of that, what we really want to move to is developing students who think critically, who can work together to solve real world problems. In the past, we've really broken everything up into little boxes. There was a social studies box and there was a language arts box and there was a math box. But we know those of us uh, adults doing work in the real world, whether that's the work that you're hired for or work in your home or work in your community, that we don't do a little bit of math and then the bell rings and we stop the math part of this problem. And then we move on to the, do the writing part of uh, this problem. We're really bringing 
all of our tools to bear at the same time to solve problems that are important for our community. So that's what we're trying to do in school as well is develop the mindset that we can solve important problems in our community. The things that we're learning are connected, they're interdisciplinary, and I can work with others in order to solve those problems. We want our students to be reflective. We want our students to learn from mistakes and be fearless about their mistakes. And we really want our schools to be places where our students can become who they want to become. Um, our teachers have been wonderful. They've done wonderful work in the past, but our building has really been a barrier. Our buildings, our school buildings have been a barrier. They're not going to be a barrier anymore. They're going to be part of how we, um, part of the solution um, for how we really develop this mindset and achieve our vision. We're going to talk a little bit more deeply about what that instruction will look like, the sort of instructional signposts um, and, and guidelines um, next. And I think uh, next is Christina talking about deeper learning. Yeah, thank you, Ben. So this visual is another way to think about the vision that was described in the video and that Ben just laid out for us. Um, deeper learning is the language that we're using to set our sights for middle school. This is what we are using as a staff, and it's really what we're going to start beginning to use with our students as well, is that we want them to engage in deeper learning. Um, and we have Portrait of a Graduate, as Ben said, as our North Star, as what we are constantly working towards. And so deeper learning is not just one thing, it's made up of many things. And it's, it's made of these pieces that you see here in yellow. Um, and these are crafts that educators have been working on for years. We, these are not new to us. We have been fine tuning them over the years and we're bringing them even stronger into next year. Um, and that's gonna show up for your students when they're in advisory, when they are receiving instruction with their core and elective classes. And then we'll also see the changes in the report card as well. All right, so we are looking at the learning neighborhoods, which really lend themselves to um, a deeper learning instructional model. Each middle school will have six learning neighborhoods. And on this slide, you'll see the neighborhood layout from a bird's eye view and then a 3D view. Um, and then on the next slide, you'll see several neighborhoods side by side. So you kind of get an idea of what the neighborhoods look like within our buildings. Each learning neighborhood will include four teachers and specialists that work together as a team to plan instruction and then use of space. And the teachers aren't necessarily assigned a particular space within the neighborhood, but will plan together to determine which space or spaces within their neighborhood best fits the learning goals uh, for their students. And as you'll see in the map, the neighborhoods include an open collaboration space, which is in the center of the neighborhood. Uh, the instructional studio, which looks more like a traditional classroom, the exploratory lab, uh, similar to a science classroom, and then there's the flex lab, which is located between the instructional studio and the exploratory lab. And then there's also a space for the team of teachers to work together and plan instruction and collaborate. There's also a glass retractable wall between the flex lab and open collaboration space. So teachers have the option of moving the wall to create an even larger combined space for their students. Also each middle school has an area with learning stairs either outside the building or inside the neighborhoods and that provides teachers additional flexibility and space for instruction. Thanks, Inkri. And so, yeah, the building really informs, well, I take that back. It isn't that it informs our instructional practices, but it helps us leverage them to be even stronger. Um, and so let's look at a few of these pieces that uh, ensure that we are achieving deeper learning for all of our students. So the first one is universal design for learning. Um, this supports students in becoming strategic and motivated learners. In this, educators create lessons that have multiple ways for students to engage, comprehend, and show their understanding. This is one way in our classrooms that we're providing access to rigorous curriculum for all of our students. And Sarah, if you go ahead and press the button, you should see some visuals. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. Um, we also have culturally responsive teaching, which is grounded in research. Um, we call it CRT for short. CRT. 
as the video kind of explained as well, it just forms connections between what students are already learning in school and to their culture and life experiences, which is really important for their developing brains. Um, it means our middle school students are going to, you know, engage in learning that is relevant. It's going to ask critical thinking of them, and it will honor the wealth of knowledge that they're already coming into us. And as Inquiry was talking about the building space, we, our core teachers, are going to be sharing space in these learning neighborhoods, which will increase our inter interdisciplinary learning. Um, like Ben said, we know that life isn't broken down into silos of math, science, social studies, language arts. Um, you know, as adults, we're constantly integrating knowledge from multiple disciplines, and we really want to make school like that. Um, because of that, our staff has been learning about project-based learning and leaning into it during distance learning and hybrid. And it's just another way that our students are gonna be able to engage in deeper learning that will be relevant. And the context will be larger than just school. Instead of making something for our teachers or for our classmates, we're really looking forward to having showcases where our families and communities can come in and see the work that students are doing that are important. And so, yeah, we're looking forward for to the horizon of both of our middle schools. So I'm just going to talk with you a little bit about um, equitable grading and reporting practices. So we really want to strive for practices that are accurate, bias resistant, and motivational. What I mean by accurate is our grading must um, use calculations that are mathematically sound, that they're easy to understand, and that they describe a student's present level of performance. Um, an example of accurate grading practices is considering more recent grades rather than averaging. If you can imagine yourself taking a test and not doing well, going back and studying and taking that test again, the more recent test would actually be descriptive of your current skill level because you had learned to that level. Now, if your teacher was to take those two tests and average them, would that really paint a picture of what you had achieved? No, the more recent score would actually be a better picture of what you knew. What we mean by bias resistance is that grades really need to be based on valid evidence of students' content knowledge, not based on evidence of their behavior. So we really wanna value that knowledge that students bring and be able to give you information on academic behaviors that we see or social behaviors in a different way. That shouldn't be factored into a grade. A grade describes a skill. A grade describes knowledge and shows to what level a student has achieved according to the standards that are set by our state. We also really believe that grading should be motivational. And I love this quote from Joe Feldman. There's no research that finds that failing grades motivate students and plenty of research that has found the opposite that a student who receives zeros and Fs become less motivated, not more motivated. We can see from our research that eighth grade students that leave middle school with more than one F have a much, much higher rate of not graduating and dropping out. So we're really invested in creating communities of feedback where students know why they have the grades that they have, know what they can do to improve that grade they have hope and they're considering their feedback that they get from teachers as a, a roadmap to improvement. And that when parents receive those report cards, they can really understand, not just, okay, my, my student got a C, my child got a C, what does that mean exactly? Instead saying, here's the skills that your students have developed mastery and here's the skills where they're still working. That's so much more informative, so much more transparent for any parents and guardians and families that are supporting our students. We also um, wanna make sure that you understand that moving to standards-based and proficiency-based grading is in alignment with what your students had in elementary school. So this is not a new format to our district and it's actually a format that's used in many of our partner and neighboring districts as well. And consequently, most of our teachers in the middle level <laughs> won't see this as a big shift at all because they're using um, some of these practices in their formative assessments, meaning that they're using rubrics, they're giving feedback, they're giving grades that are reflective of the type of practices that we want to see 
on our actual report card that goes home and is a part of a student's permanent record. All right, thanks, Sarah. I think you covered my slide. I don't have much to say. No, just kidding. Uh, thank you. No, that was very informative. So um, I'm just going to talk about where we've been and where we're going. Um, so it started many years ago in the district that we've been looking at proficiency grading. Um, we transitioned to that in the elementary schools many years ago and a middle school and high school were at the same table. Um, we started there and really tried to work out all the kinks. Um, and then as middle school has progressed for the past few years, we've been using proficiency grading to give feedback in our grade books and teachers are very familiar with that. However, the reporting of those proficiency, uh, we hadn't made it there quite yet. And so that is what we're transitioning to next year. So what we see here on this timeline um, is that the design team in 2016 to 18 was really working on portrait of a graduate and then the standards based grading. So we've been working, what are those standards? What are those key learning that every child needs to learn in each of the courses along the way. Then in 2019, uh, we continued our prof professional development on deeper learning. So what does that look like getting into those standards? Now that we've selected those standards, how do we make sure that our students not only can understand what they're doing, but how do they apply them to real world circumstances? And it takes us to 2020, our distance learning and essential standards work. So in distance learning, we continued that same work of proficiency based grading um, in our feedback. So that one through four in the grade book and in the feedback that uh, students received in their Google classrooms. Um, and teachers have been working on those essential standards as well, really paring them down um, from the state and making sure that we know which ones we really want to report on to parents so that they know what their students are learning. 2021, um, we're looking at a new schedule, buildings and report cards that will take place this next fall. Um, so the new schedule will be combining some of those block times where we'll be able to do that deeper learning that Inkree and Christina talked about. Um, create that partnership, that cross-disciplinary work between the different teachers, then how we report that to parents will be really important. So that's what we're doing here. We're gonna look at that in just a moment. What do those report cards look like with those standards and how students are learning? So that's the goal with these new report cards to really report how students are learning on skills, which are those standards. Um, and this following year in 2022, we will continue to do professional development. They'll continue to do things with, um, it's okay, this is great. Uh, take a look at this uh, report card. It's just kind of a sample that we have here, but the next year we'll continue to communicate what this looks like to parents and we'll learn alongside the teachers to really see how this dy dynamic report card works. So what you see here is basically a course of humanities um, and three specific standards. We've worked to then make those standards in parent-friendly language. And we'd love to hear from you to kind of get a preview. If you're interested, we'd love to have you participate in that. Take a look at those standards. Do they make sense to you so that they're not in education jargon? Okay, and then at on the, if we can go back one slide, that'd be great. Uh, on the next to each standard on the right-hand side, you'll see a score. Um, it will either be a number or a descriptor about where your student is. Um, using the numbers, one being at a basic level, three, mastering that standard, four, going beyond that standard. Um, we could also use descriptors. We'd love some feedback there as well. We currently are using numbers, but um, we are open to suggestion and feedback for our community because the idea of these report cards is communication with families, students, and teachers as a team, because we have to partner together and really focus on learning and how can we improve our learning overall. All right, and so our last slide. Uh, Mr. Cates. Or you want me to, is it me? Questions? I can do it. 
Well, we have this um, opportunity for feedback and input through focus groups. So a couple of different opportunities, student focus groups to give us some input on um, the language that's in the report cards and also family focus groups um, in order to get some feedback. Did we actually make the language friendly? Is it not in uh, educational jargon, which we're trying to avoid? If you're interested in that, we've got a form. That QR code also leads you to the form. You could participate in one of those um, feedback groups so we could really do what we're trying to do, which is to accurately communicate to you um, how your child is doing in our schools. We'll also, it says at the bottom here, attend additional forums. We will have future forums like this one. We're planning one for next month um, on the 20th, I believe, of May, focused on the schedule, um, possibly uh, as well as um, the, the construction. We're still, we're finalizing our details on how that one's going to work. Um, looks like the, that we had changed something in the form. So if you're trying the form now, it should work. It is also now in the chat. I think at this time, I'll pass it over to Lisa Norman, who's going to uh, organize our Q&A session here. Great. Thank you. Um, I have opened the chat to, um, to attendees. If you have questions for the panelists, you can enter those um, into the chat at this time, and then we will try to get to as many of your questions as we can. Um, it might take a minute for folks to come up with a question. I'm wondering if, um, Mr. Sweeten, you spoke a lot about the, the grading. Um, will that report card that you're, you're talking about, will that begin with the first uh, grading period of next year? And will it be at six weeks? Will we do it at six weeks again, or will that be a semester report? It's a great question. So we have in middle school, we are the only level that is still in semesters. Um, <laughs> I chuckle because uh, we always think about whether or not we're going to move to trimesters. Um, but right now we're on semesters. So we have two progress periods, um, after one after the first six weeks, then we have the next six weeks, and then we have semester that's the, at the end of January. Um, for each of those, yes, they would be uh, the dynamic report cards. Um, the progress would show each of those standards. So yes, so some report cards are the transcript report cards, right? And those would also have the standards, but the progress um, periods would as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. There is a couple questions, uh, several questions about um, start and stop times. So could you um, tell us what time middle school will start next year? and what time middle school will get out next year. I know we changed the time this year um, back to what, to the earlier version. So perhaps you, Mr. Cates, you can share that one. Sure, I put it in the chat as well. Um, start time next year is 9.30 and then school gets out at four. Um, this was part of uh, realigning the start times um, starting with uh, the high school who were moving to making um, high school um, start time more developmentally appropriate. Um, high schools often start very early um, and that doesn't really align with the, what we know about um, how teenagers need to sleep. Um, so we've realigned a little bit. Um, we, we, have, we intended to start at 930 this year, um, but the, the pandemic had other ideas. Um, so we had a different start time, but next year, 930 to 4. Thank you. Um, perhaps each of you could speak to what the block schedule will look like at Ogden and what it will look like at Gardner. Well, you said Ogden first, so I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Um, the block schedule and we'll be, um, I, th I think we'll be ready to share um, a visual with you um, at the next one, but really what you're talking about um, is very similar at both schools, although, you know, both schools are a little bit different. We have slightly different populations and I'm sure Michael will talk about this. The um, bilingual program um, at Gardner means that we have to staff things slightly differently. So we often try to align perfectly, but then aren't able to do it because we have slightly different staffing, slightly different students. Um, but the block schedule, um, uh, we'll start with, um, most likely we'll start with advisory most days of the week. Um, and then students will 
go to their learning neighborhood all together, all together, the whole team of students will go to their learning neighborhood. If you're new to middle school, both middle schools split their students into teams. There's, um, at Ogden, there's two teams per grade. It's slightly different at, at Gardner. Um, so your whole sixth grade team, half of the sixth grade goes to their learning neighborhood. The other half of the sixth grade goes to the, their learning neighborhood. And the teachers will decide what kind of learning activities they're engaging in. It could be math. It could be language arts. They could all be going on at the same time. They could all be working on um, just one of those all together. It looks different on different days. And that's going to be a pretty large chunk of time, two, two and a half hours, depending on the grade that you're in, really. Um, and then there's a block for electives, which is about an 80 minute block somewhere in there. Um, electives some days and health or PE other days. And then um, another large block of um, team time in those learning neighborhoods. In the middle there, obviously there's a, a, a lunch and recess as well. So larger blocks of learning all together, less moving around, not a six or a seven period schedule where we're scurrying to different places every 49 minutes or something like that, but really spending enough time to do the topic justice. All right, I'll add to that uh, for Gardner, very similar as well, uh, advisory each day, um, early release Wednesday, so probably no advisory on that day. Um, they will they do have chunks of time basically where they're in their neighborhood learning those uh, core academics from interdisciplinary teams. Uh, we have, uh, then they do leave for electives, health PE. Um, we do have that in there as well. I saw a little question about that. Um, they do that as well. Um, and that's basically how their day works. I mean, on paper, it kind of still looks like the blocks, a little, how it has traditionally, but the difference is the blocks of time, it's not a fixed time where they have to do something. It's actually a time where they can spend more time on science if they need to, if they need to get deeper into learning a math application, um, they can do that. Um, so that's why we're calling them kind of these learning blocks um, in our schedule where they're all together in a neighborhood. Um, I did also see how big they are for Gardner. It varies uh, whether it's bilingual or sixth grade or seven, eight blends um, teams. So our teams are a little bit different. We have sixth grade teams, we have seven, eight teams, and we have a six, eight bilingual. Um, we're looping with them in six and the seven, eight, I mean, uh, and then also in bilingual. So uh, that's, I think I hit all the things. I'm starting to ramble, sorry guys. Thank you, Michael. There's one more question before we move on from Gardner about um, the bilingual program and what will that look like at the middle school level? It's a great question. Yeah, so they have their own dedicated um, core contents just like any other team does now. So they will have a Spanish language arts, Spanish science, Spanish social studies. The rest of their classes are in English, but they will have a dedicated math teacher, um, health teachers, and they go out to electives as well. So um, depending on the grade, but they will, they actually all rotate within one neighborhood because um, it's two classes of each grade level. Thank you. I'm gonna give this next question to Dr. Dubois. It is about um, GPAs and um, traditional grades and the concern that those, will those still exist? And how will that align with high school and college? This is a bit multi-part. Do you wanna start there and then I can add more in a minute? Sure, okay. I'd be happy to. So um, one thing to be aware of is that middle school courses are not credit bearing unless you are taking high school level courses in middle school, which is unusual. Um, in which case I have seen in the past, sometimes those high school credit type, um, if we were able to go that path, that those high school courses would receive a traditional grade. But to cross the two things with one another can be very confusing um, for you and for your student. Um, we're working with partners that have had these proficiency and standard-based report cards for many, many years. And there's lessons learned from those districts um, that have gone through some of the 
growth and growing pains of changing over systems and working with ODE to change over to those systems that we will benefit from. Um, actually, our partner, Estacada, has proficiency-based grading all the way through senior high, all the way through 12th grade, but right now we are not pursuing it at the high school level, only at the middle level. So um, GPAs at the high school level will stay the same, letter grades will still be at the high school the same as they've always been. What will be nice is that um, those teachers of the freshmen as they receive the files coming up from middle school will actually have um, more in-depth information on student needs as students come to them because it will be according to each of the standards within um, their discipline and the standards in Oregon are recursive. So they build on one another. So when I'm a freshman teacher of English, um, most of my standards are built right off the eighth grade standards at the next skill level. So to be able to see um, standard by standard how a student was performing is actually very helpful for me to meet a student's needs, much more helpful than just a B grade or C grade. Um, that, that's gonna tell me a whole lot more. Um, go ahead, Lisa, what else do, what else do I got? I think that the other part is um, sometimes GPAs and grades are needed to apply for other activities like honor society um, or academic programs and just questions about how that might translate. Yeah, and what, I, what I've seen done successfully at my own um, students are middle and high school age and have proficiency-based report cards. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, you can, uh, most places that uh, ask for those kinds of things have seen proficiency-based report cards before. But one of the things that you can do is also ask a teacher for a letter of recommendation or a note or an email, a letter of reference. If um, you have a, a, some kind of organization that is wanting more than what the report card provides, that's, that's something that I've seen done as well. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is around, um, will the learning spaces be loud and will there be a lot of kids in those learning spaces? So um, perhaps the principals want to address that? Each building is a little different. I went first last time, but that's okay. I'll go first again. Um, uh, the learning neighborhoods will, at, at Ogden, it, it depends on enrollment, of course, but if we have the enrollment that we're projecting a sort of typical, back to a typical year of enrollment, you'll have somewhere between 130 or 140 students in those learning neighborhoods, which is um, not going to feel super crowded. It's, it's really built for that number of students. Um, uh, it's the same as having split up into four classrooms, um, but we are going to have um, all four teachers in there at the same time, which I think is a question that's coming. Um, plus, um, we're hopefully, um, we're, we're working on it now, I don't, I don't know what I'm saying, hopefully we'll have an, a specialist pushed in there, could be a learning specialist, might be the ELD teacher, um, and, and Ogden also um, an instructional assistant. So plenty of adult support, um, a comfortable number of students, and also, you know, all brand new furniture that's really dialed in for those spaces, which, you know, we'll talk more about um, next month and as we get closer uh, to uh, a finished spaces, but I think they're going to be very comfortable um, sized. Remembering that at least at Ogden, we had all kinds of sizes of classrooms. Some were big, some were small. Most had no windows. Some had heat, some had too much heat. Um, so it's going to be very different. I think a much more comfortable learning um, environment. The noise, um, you know, this is uh, our buildings are designed by architects who specialize in schools. So they know what they're getting into. Those spaces that you saw, they all close. The doors close. Um, they, they can be open if you need them to be. That, that uh, wall can be open, but it can also be closed. And then you're just in the classroom like you would be anywhere else um, with classrooms next door to each other. Um, so it's not going to be a problem. And I'll say one more thing, and then Michael can jump in. But we have um, a sound reinforcement system in every learning space um, called Front Row. And what that means is the um, instructor can wear a microphone and their speaker spread throughout so they can speak in a normal voice um, and you can be heard anywhere in that learning space by the teacher speaking in a normal voice and they're directional they're pointed down um, and not towards the other classrooms so it's also that sound is not bleeding into those other classrooms either um, it'll be easy to hear the instructor and they won't have to um, raise their voice to be heard way at the back of the room I think you did a great job there, Mr. Cates. 
Yeah, I think uh, I would I would agree with all of those things. Our class sizes will be quite a bit larger than what we've had um, at Gardner. Um, so that will be extremely beneficial. Um, there's carpet in some of them. There are hard surfaces in others. Um, we can open those uh, doors like Mr. Cates talked about to make them um, you know, transparent. They're transparent so they can see through a lot of them. Um, so, but uh, you can close them off as needed and then you can open them up so you can do larger instructor with bigger groups, mix them up into different um, teams if you want to, or you can do uh, individual. So there's, it's basically, we've made it so it's very flexible for all different types of learners and for different types of learning. Um, so there will be times when they're working independently. There will be times when they're working in groups. There will be times when they're doing some type of entire uh, team activity that could be that entire group altogether. Thank you. There are a couple questions about the learning communities. One is what if a child needs a quiet space to work? And the other is how will um, my child get individual help or support if their groups are that big? Michael. All right. Yeah, so within those spaces, there are smaller spaces. Um, so we, we have uh, at Gardner, we have two, um, I guess you would call them conference rooms. We're kind of calling them project labs, um, but students can use those uh, either in small groups or they could use them individually. Um, there are other spaces in the building as well um, where they can go. There's an active learning center. We've tried to make sure that there were lots of different options. Again, I go back to it's flexible spaces um, was the key from the design team. They wanted to make sure that when we do want everyone together, we can, but when we want to separate out, if we want quiet learning, um, individual learning, that is also a possibility. Uh, we'll, doing, we'll be doing as much push-in instruction as possible um, with our specialists uh, when appropriate. And when it's not, then uh, there are spaces where they can um, take small groups um, to work in those uh, conference rooms or in other spaces um, like the Active Learning Center. Uh, we have lots of conference rooms throughout the building. So um, yeah, I think that uh, they'll find that the flexibility will really um, be you know, uh, advantageous to all different types of lear learners. I don't really have anything to add, really covered it there. I think you'll see a lot more individualization, honestly, a lot more individual attention with the new model. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dubois, can you um, talk a little bit about how the new skills, the new, the, the skills that we'll be focusing on will translate to our state and federal testing? Absolutely. So, um, the standards that are measured on our state tests and on the Common Core standards are the same standards that would um, be on your report cards. So they are really one and the same. The difference is um, as a practice, we don't report on every single standard that we have because we have some standards that are identified as priority standards and others that are supporting standards. So we don't plan to give you a 16 page novel of every, every standard that we train on. What we want to give you are the highest priority standards um, and give you a proficiency score based on where your student is at according to that. And the tests are really based on the priority standards as well with some supporting standards um, that are kind of woven in throughout the test. So uh, those standards are one in the same. So they're actually very well aligned. Sorry, I lost my mouse for a minute. Um, the next question is about homework. There's a couple questions in here about um, what will homework look like? Will it where the will there be homework? Um, will there be an increase in homework? Um, some folks are saying that they come from schools that don't have homework. So just a question about with this new model, what can they expect for homework? Or do you know that yet? I wonder if our instructional coaches want to take that one. 
Um, I'll start by saying, I think it may be different based off teachers and teams, of course, right? Because it's their instructional choice of what they see best as for students. Um, however, in this model, we're hoping to engage students right in deeper learning, which means we're working um, closely in our classrooms. So if there is homework, it may be more as, hey, if this is an option for you to practice and refine this skill, or if there's something that they maybe didn't finish that they're moving on with. But I, I don't see that happening as much, frankly, just because there is room now for that more individualized and merely being flexible and responsive to what kids need. Because, you know, before we had six periods and we wanted to keep them aligned. And so we kept moving on with, with if our students weren't there yet, but we don't have that anymore. We're really freed of that. Um, so saying it could happen because it's open to teachers, but I don't see it being something that you need to prepare yourself to sit down with your student for an hour and a half every night. Thank you. There is a great safety and security question in the chat about um, how will these new spaces be safe for students if we have a lockdown situation and will they be able to be um, in space in, in a space where they can't be seen? And I know the schools are different, so perhaps each of you could address that. Sure, I'll start on that one. Yeah, so just to let you know, uh, we did have a safety security um, outside firm look at our buildings and identify areas of need or growth and before we even got to the building stage. Um, so we, we made sure that there are different areas where there's lockdown. So at the entry point, there's a secure vestibule um, that anyone who comes in will be screened basically there before they enter and they'll have to buzz in and they'll have to then be fed into the office. From the office, they then have to be buzzed into our main school. Um, from our main corridor, there's also a sliding um, a gate that comes down that locks that entire hallway off when the, when the secure button goes down. Um, then that secures the timber hall area all of the learning neighborhoods are actually meant to be a secure area in themselves. However, they still can within those neighborhoods go into further inside and secure themselves into one of those, uh, one, well, many of those different spaces. So they have doors and things that close all of those and then get outside. So you can't actually see that well into a neighborhood, um, but if you had to just secure yourself within the neighborhood, you have that possibility as well. Um, each of our different types of suites, our music suite, our fitness suite, fabrication, all of those have that same model. Um, so there's a secure kind of entry point. And then within that, each of those different spaces can be locked as well. It's similar at Ogden. It's actually far more secure now than it was in the past because um, we, we've substantially updated the security features, including, as Michael was saying, how you get into the building is much more secure. Um, the security of the classroom spaces, the learning neighborhoods is significantly enhanced. Um, we're rekeying everything. So uh, even who has keys and access to which areas, um, we're starting over. Um, so it'll be much more secure, similar. Um, as far as different zones get locked down um, when we're in an emergency. So it's going to be actually substantially more secure uh, while still being very welcoming. Um, I think it's really, it's a really good balance. We have time for just a couple quick, there's some logistical questions in here. Um, there is one about, will there be lockers? Mr. Case, you already said, yes, there will be PE. And a question about, will there still be AVID and at Gardner, they have Encore. So will those things still exist? And um, Michael. All right, so <laughs> let me see if I can remember those. Encore for sixth grade mm -hmm. uh, will go away. It's actually being replaced by something called X-Block. Um, so it's similar, but not exactly the same. Um, so they will have something like that. It won't be, it will be more exploratory and more engaging than um, just additional time to catch up. Um, then I think we talked about lockers. Um, we have lockers for 
the wellness suite, which is fitness area. Um, we do have that, um, but we do not have lockers traditionally in hallways because we don't have hallways anymore, basically. Um, the other thing was uh, many, it seems like years ago now, when we did focus groups with students, both high schoolers, middle schoolers, and um, at the time it was fifth graders, uh, the thing that causes the most anxiety and stress were locker combinations. Um, and if you took band and you took uh, PE and you have a locker, now you have three combinations during a passing period that becomes very stressful. Um, so kids started actually worrying about that in fifth grade before they even get to middle school. So we've tried to take as many of those stressors out um, of the equation in the new building. I also want to add, and they have to remember their bus route in if you're at Ogden and your bus route home. And it is extremely stressful for our incoming sixth graders to try to remember all of that. So I appreciate that they um, get a locker taken off of their, their schedule. Um, we ha do have some questions and Mr. Cates has been doing a good job of um, answering those in the chat, but there is one that I want to end with. And that is, uh, it's so exciting that these buildings are going to be open. So can you talk about when they will be finished and if you will be providing tours um, in your new buildings? Yeah, um, Ogden is slated to be finished mid-August. And it's really kind of amazing that we've stayed on track given all of the natural disasters. Um, we did lose power for a whole week at Ogden with the ice storm. I know many people lost power, but it's really hard to run a construction site without power, um, but we were able to catch up. Um, so we're on track right now. Um, as far as tours, we actually just met to talk about public tours today, um, and we'll be able to give tours uh, for sure starting um, after the building is open and we um, are allowed to occupy the building and then we'll have a plan for tours even including um, some virtual tours um, the district is um, uh, and, and michael knows more about this but is investing in some tools so that we can have um, tours available to everyone um, from home uh, along the lines of what you see these days um, when you're buying a new home or you're looking at homes where you can walk through the whole building um, in 3d so both will be available uh, I think those are the questions, but I feel like I left something out. If I did, I'm sure Michael will get it. I think you got them. Those are great. Yeah, we'll be doing those in August. That is wonderful. Okay, we have one more minute. So I'm going to ask this real quick question because there is a little bit of talk about um, concerns with the later start time and how early kids can come to school. So um, that that later start time might be a little difficult for parents, especially working parents to leave their kids home if they have to leave early in the morning. So perhaps um, you can speak to at what point will the kids be able to enter the building? In the past, we've allowed about a half an hour before. Um, we do have some uh, basically like zero period type of activities um, throughout the year like jazz band and I think acapella choir, things like that. We also have student council that meets before school. So we do have some activities that run before school. Um, and uh, we tend to allow the school to be open about a half an hour before. We just don't have a lot of staff and that's also our meeting time. So we do have to make sure it's kind of a little bit limited um, uh, and we can't have the whole school there. <laughs> Mr. Cates, anything to add? Nope, same. We usually open about a half an hour before. We would love to run some zero period activities and we'll try to do that, but um, that is part of the time when um, staff are meeting, IEP meetings, other kinds of meetings, staff meetings happen before school, um, which makes it a little bit difficult. Uh, but um, yeah, about a half an hour before is usually when we open the doors somewhere around there. Um, I know we're over time and we're actually getting to all the questions, I think. And there's a question about um, if the high school is also going to have no lockers since the middle school is not going to have lockers. And I see Dr. Du Bois has her hand up. Well, they're not going to remove any of the lockers, but I can tell you firsthand that the students don't use them. 
there's there the lockers are mainly used at the high school for kids that have like an after school activity or an instrument that they need to store. Um, very few kids at the high school actually utilize their locker in between classes. Um, but there's no plan to remove them at the high school. Just we've found that they tend to be space that isn't well utilized and could be better be put to use for other things. So, um, yeah. Uh, and with the lockers, we had a lot of students hanging out in the hallways because they had to get their stuff. And that's when students reported they felt the, the least safe was in those hallways. So really keeping them in their learning communities um, was in part response to that. Um, the, the hallways were a challenging time. Also, all students will have a PE locker um, because all students take PE. And we still have PE lockers or health and wellness at, at Gardner. And so that will be an opportunity for them to practice using lockers before they get to the high school. Thank you. I, um, you also addressed, there was a question about how will teachers monitor bullying in the, in the larger learning communities. And I think that um, what we saw is a lot of that happened in the hallways at the middle school and by not having them move between classes, it feels like we will be able to monitor that much better. Yeah, keep kids safer. All right, um, we can save this chat and you, you all can go through it and see if there's anything you wanna to respond to in your weekly emails, but I just appreciate everyone's time and thank you for answering all those questions and for submitting all those questions to our, to our families. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you all being here. Yeah, guys. Well you can you can pause recording if you want to. Oh yeah, good idea. Stop. <laughs>